I had to strip down to next to nothing, grease up, put a towel over the cut section of bar off the window so it wouldn't scratch my back, and levered myself out. Well, Sten wrenched that up just another little inch, probably strangling everybody he'd always hated since childhood, but just enough for me to get out. I learned many and terrible things about the Thai courts that virtually everybody is found guilty. I went to court and was transferred to Klong Prem Prison. That's the main Bangkok prison, sometimes called Bangkok Hilton. It's huge. It contains 12 sub-prisons, over 8,000 people crammed in there. The first night you spend jammed into a cell, wearing chains. They're squashed around your ankles with a C-ring and a connecting chain. And then lectured to by one of the trustees in the cell that he doesn't tolerate pooing in the cell. And reluctantly, he'll let you take a pee in the corner of the, the hole in the floor toilet. The foreigner's section was nothing but a broken collection of ruined people that the wind had blown into a corner of Asia. Nobody in there was going anywhere. Their sentences were usually between 40 years to life. Out of 40 years, people would serve 30. A policeman from Australia visited to say how destroyed I was, how even if I survived 20 years here, they'd make sure that I faced some charges back there. I tore up all my court paperwork and made sure that they didn't know that my case was um, a death case. And so I didn't have chains on all the time. Because from the moment I stepped into that prison in Bangkok, escape was on my mind. Sundays they let people walk out of the building and go to a Christian church meeting. And with my own personal trusty uh, prisoner, uh, Harry, a Chinese guy, he uh, took me around and I looked at all the bars. And where they kept the foreigners were uh, very heavy bars. They didn't trust foreigners. You couldn't have a ground floor cell if you were a foreigner. Three floors up was the closest to the ground you'd get. They, foreigners just might try something. Well, a story some Swiss guy did once, but nothing came of it. I would advise anybody, when it comes to escapes, it's like voting. Escape early and escape often, because that's the best chance you'll get. Really, even though I'd done my very best to find out where I was within the prison, I didn't know. I had the room, and I had one to go with me, the big Viking, Sten. Sten had drifted around Asia for a few years and ended up getting tangled up as a courier with some group. I got a feeling old Sten double-crossed them, and I'd heard stories about him uh, helping himself to the silverware at places he'd stayed around town, but that didn't matter. It's how people treat you when they're with you, the counts, and in an escape, there's one thing for sure, everybody is alone. A few things happened at once towards the end of my time there. Firstly, I was told that my case would be brought to an end. I would be found guilty as, and within two weeks sentenced to death. And the execution wasn't pretty. One thing, it was certain, it was by machine gun. The prisoner is tied to a plank and a machine gun that is welded to a bench has three strings attached to it. Three guards pull those strings because n none of them can say, yes, it was my tug of that string that ended this man's life. Maybe it's a, a Buddhist consideration, I don't know. But they wouldn't wear the guilt necessarily. I'd been told by the my contact with the American embassy that an example would be made of a European, a Westerner soon. And I couldn't think of a better example from their point of view than me. So when I knew that I had perhaps two weeks left to go before my case would end, 
I would be found guilty, sentenced to death. Another thing that pushed things along was that I really was alone. My Viking friend pulled out. Why? A few weeks uh, towards August, I think it was, two Israelis were transferred from the north in Chiang Mai. The Israelis that had arrived from Chiang Mai had uh, put off Sten from coming with me on the escape. Their legs looked like they, they were deformed, twisted, broken and reset. They looked like some angry kid in McDonald's had crushed up the drinking straws and thrown them to the ground. They'd escaped from that prison in Chiang Mai because it was an easy lockup, but they'd been ruthlessly hunted down. Their picture was on every tuk-tuk driver. The police actually weren't involved. It was the prison guards hunting them down. Such was the shame of all of this. They went to their old friend, the guest house manager, who milked them for their remaining money, turned them in. When they were arrested, they were thrown down in a dungeon somewhere in the Chiang Mai prison. Iron bars were used to shatter their legs and big rocks thrown onto them. Having served in the Israeli army, they were made of reasonably stern stuff, and one dragged himself out from under the rubble and nursed the other one back with a bit of water. So by the time they arrived in Bangkok, they were a bit brighter, but wearing elephant chains with these mangled legs. When Stan the Swede saw those, big and mighty though he be, he said to me, I have nowhere to go on release. I've been prompting him to get a passport. I, I wouldn't know what to do. He was almost angry with me for building this up. He never really thought it was going to happen. And I told him it's happening tonight. It was because the guard who usually slept outside um, the, the grounds outside my window was not there. Turned off the light, waited, turned to Sten, who'd promised to help me during the night, and said, it's happening. Without telling anybody, I started unpacking the cell. I'd had time, time to build furniture which could come apart and go back together as a stepladder to the tall upper window, the only window in the cell. I put that together, went into the shower and broke apart a poster that somebody had sent me, Michael actually, which had two tungsten or hacksaw blades in the top and bottom of the dowel rods holding the poster. I figured they wouldn't wreck it because it had a vaguely religious nonsense written on it. Other tools I took out from a pocket knife to a laser pen, flashlight, other things that were hidden around the cell started to work on the, the bars. Now, I'd made a rough timing of what I thought everything would take, but the first stroke of that tungsten steel on these old bars was like a, the worst violin player in town. It seemed to carry throughout the whole building. So while Sten worked on that, slowly grinding his way through, I had my nose glued to the cracks in the cell bar on the sleeping guard, probably 60 feet down the way. He stirred a couple of times. I had to tell Sten to stop, but nobody passed. It was after midnight. An hour later, the first bar is not even cut. I went to work on it myself, dispensed with the oil, got through it. As it broke, it sprang away from the rest of the set of bars and frame of that window. So old was the building that it had twisted and the, the bars had been under pressure. So they, they were pushing against each other. Went to work on the second cut of the first bar. And time's going on. I hadn't accounted for this. Sten said, look, let's leave it for tonight. We'll go the next night. We couldn't. There was an Indian guy in there, Mirage. It was very real for a Mirage. He, he would have been straight out there thinking me out or would have led to an accident or he would have done something. Even as it was, I had to persuade him to be quiet on the night. I had to be quite cruel to him in a way to frighten him because when he started moaning a bit loudly at the grief of being caught with people escaping, I had to lean down next to him and I got close to his ear. I said, Mirage, 
Believe me when I tell you the only reason, the only reason I don't kill you immediately is that it would upset my friends in the cell. But it won't upset me and I will if you make another sound. He was quiet after that and we went on. I don't think I would have, but I had to make it persuasive. I got through to halfway through the second bar and it was three, almost three o'clock in the morning. I couldn't wait any longer. Luckily, Sten was, had been working out with his homemade weights of concrete and whatnot. He climbed up on the, the frame and grabbed that bar in a towel and wrenched it forward and gave me about six inches clearance. That six inches would have to do. On the side of the wall, there was a bookshelf. It wasn't really. It was a building site plank that we'd managed to persuade the guard was going to become a bookshelf, and in fact was until it came off there, slid into the side of the bars and projected out into the night air. It was held in place by a footstool that twisted around to be a set of locking pins that would hold that that plank sideways poking out so that I could climb along it and then get out of that cell, which was just the first step. I took out six, six no, eight picture frames. Stan had pretended an interest in oil painting, which gave him a chance to put together some very stout, very stout frames to hold the canvas. These were in fact to be the rungs of my ladder. I took out from my bag 100 meters of army boot webbing, the rope. It had actually served time as my bed frame as well, but that untangled well enough. I had to strip down to next to nothing, grease up, put a towel over the cut section of bar off the window so it wouldn't scratch my back, and levered myself out while Sten wrenched that up just another little inch, probably strangling everybody he'd always hated since childhood but just enough for me to get out. And then I held on to the outside bar. And instantaneously, like some insect clinging to a window, I was no longer part of their world. I looked in on that cell as though I was looking at strangers. I threw that army belt webbing over the plank and slid to the ground. I had clever plans of abseiling, but that all fell to pieces and I tore the skin off my hands flicked the rope off back down to my hands as it spaghetti to the ground and Sten slid back that uh, plank into the cell so it wouldn't be seen and said, of course, send me a postcard. Everybody thinking that I wouldn't make it very far. I knew roughly where the guards were, yet there was another flaw in my plan. I timed it during the day. The world is a different place at night, completely different. Everything takes longer. A window, that, a door that had been secured, I had to take out a nail. The nail took some pincers. The nail made a protest as it came out and squeaked. Even I did put oil on it, but that was taking time. Went past our old toilet and cooking area. Had to freeze for a minute while a guard got up to take some water. Drooling because I'm holding a torch in my mouth as I'm trying to arrange these picture frames into window struts had gaffer tape from a care package that was sent in and cable ties, made two very long ladders. I had a sea of walls to cover and felt like I had no energy left. But knowing what would happen, knowing, never mind death, death's nothing, knowing that I would die slowly and horribly, I went on. By around 4.30, perhaps 5 o'clock, I'd found my way to the outside wall. I'd known that from the church meetings. But there was another problem. Below the main and very tall wall, more than twice the wall of the height of any prison I've ever seen, there was only a foot and a half of land space. Before that was a a place we called Marsbar Creek. It was an inner moat. There was actually the sewer. So what? Go through the sewer, carry my letters through the sewer. But I couldn't because they were full of barbed wire and I would have got tangled up in them. Here's the thing. If I'd been with Sten, if I'd been with anybody else, 
We would have argued about how to get across Mars Bar Creek. We would have <coughs> lost time. We would have lost the important time. I wouldn't be here. I broke a bit of the, uh, one of the long ladders off, put the ladder against on an angle, got over to the little tiny ledge, anchored that in, used my bit of rope and levered that ladder over there. I was between two guard towers. One, I could see faint stirrings, or imagined I could, what was the point? <laughs> Just go on. Managed to lever that ladder up against the wall and get to the top, which has barbed wire and electricity. And I could see the faint glow of dawn as I looked over that wall. And that was encouragement too. I got myself over that top wall by just going very slowly and not being freaked out by those tingles that you get through your clothing and your sweat with when there's electrical wire running past you. That had knocked a couple of people off years before I'd heard, so I knew what to expect. I used the last bit of army boot webbing to make a rope to sail to the ground and found myself before the 25 meter main moat and realized there wasn't time to go across that plastic bag full of clothes or not, swimming or not. It would have been noisy, it was so quiet. I had to go around the one place I could walk. That was the front entrance because I realized I'd gone to the side wall, not the back. I had one thing that helped me, well, perhaps two. I'd cleaned myself up with the last of the water and put on some long khaki pants. Prisoners were not allowed to wear anything but shorts. And khaki, which was the color of the guard's uniform. And I put up an umbrella, a black pop-up umbrella from the umbrella factory. And it was just raining enough so that I had an excuse to put up that umbrella because I, as I walked slowly towards the front crossing bridge at the front of the prison, this is where guards are arriving for work and where there's shops and people are setting up for the day, I thought somebody looking down must figure, maybe it's a guard coming in late, but one thing's for sure, escaping prisoners don't take the trouble to bring an umbrella in case it rains. And I got to the front and I even saw, because I'm peeking here, my own personal guard from Building 6 arriving for work. I don't know what it was. I'm sure he recognized the way I walked. He thought something wasn't right. But I kept my head down and crossed the parkway to the six-lane highway that goes to the airport. But I can't take that yet. I climbed up in the pedestrian walkway and turned around and looked at the prison. Looked back upon, what, 12,000 people, two and a half years of my life the deaths, the suffering in there, and felt like it had nothing to do with me and couldn't work out why they stayed, why they never wanted to come. Where everybody else had failed and where I'd seen escapes fail before is what happens after you get out. I climbed down, I took two taxis because I had an address. When I arrived there, I broke open a a wooden key tag. This key I had was encased in wood. In case I was caught and then tortured for information about a key I had, I didn't want to have to answer that one. And you don't know what you're going to say under torture, do you? I opened the door to the apartment, went to the little toilet in the back, and then started feeling back behind the mirror. And saying to myself, David, you met Harry in prison a Chinese friend in there. He was released and he's told you that he's got a passport that has to be stolen within the last three weeks so that it's, uh, it can be put on the computer and the visa matches up, that it's had the visa put in it, that it has the passenger arrival card and is on the computer. And he's taken my old radio operator's license photograph and had it transformed into this new passport that's just been stolen. And that dear David, is waiting for you behind a toilet in an apartment to which you just happen to have the key. Is that likely? But I felt the cardboard edge of an envelope and then opened it up. I don't guess I would have cared what it was in there, but it was good enough. 
and I was back on my way to the airport within minutes. And a fresh set of worries. Because at the airport, I'd given my money away to the guys in the cell they'd needed to protect themselves from the worst of the guards' actions. I had two ATM cards. I'm trying to decide where to go. I picked up a travelling bag, which was left in the long-term luggage office by another good friend, the importance of friends. Put my ATM card in, pressed it up, and it, it says, please contact your bank. OK. The second one, though, paid out, and I had to work out where I could go with $500. Not far. Singapore, in fact. Bought myself a ticket, hurried to the gate because it's on a call. Immigration officer at the desk. And at every stage I'm wondering where this passport's going to fail because I know it's going to fail. Harry couldn't have known somebody who had somebody at the airport who typed it in. But trust your Chinese triad mafia. They know what they're doing. Their word's good enough. and. After a bit of a frown, he tapped me through, and I was on the plane. Delay taking off, but finally the most satisfying th sound of the thwomp, as doors to manual says the captain, and it's locked up, and the air pressure changes, and you get into takeoff position, and then land at Singapore. And I've had an hour to think of the death penalty in Singapore, and had an hour to look at this passport, the graininess of the photograph as, as it's been transferred and other sets of problems that might occur. Have the, my Chinese friends taken the trouble to put the pink ultraviolet ink across the photograph edge? An hour's too long to worry, but there I was. At Singapore, I think the immigration man agreed with me. The photograph wasn't satisfactory. So he slid it under the ultraviolet light. And I... Because it happened so often in my life before, that one moment before the end and everything's all over, because Singapore would have sent me straight back, never mind the fuss of extradition, handed it back to me. I took two taxis to an airport, went straight to the shop there, bought a pair of swimming trunks, dumped my bag in my room, took the lift to the top floor where there was a swimming pool, dropped my towel, dived in the deep end, swam to the other end, my clean moat, lifted myself out, stared across the hills in Singapore, and moved on. That was it. Did you ever find out what happened to Sten? Sten the Swede, my Viking on the night, he, did he regret uh, not leaving with me? Perhaps he did, but he stayed. He was sentenced to uh, 50 years, served 12 of them before being repatriated to Sweden, was released, and lives happily, as far as I know, with a new wife and some children. How about you, when you look back on it all? Do you see your story as a regretful episode or something that shaped you? How do you think it's changed you in terms of who you are today? It has certainly produced a person, well, my life has produced a person who has a regular nightmare with a different prison every night. Extraordinarily, how they look so different every night, but there's always one. And as far as my waking life is concerned, I think, would I be willing to forgo all that I've seen and learned and understood for a, a quieter life? Yes and no, but it does wreak huge destruction. And I think this, in some ways, it's a wasted life. If a person has the capacity to do something good or more interesting or, hell, even helpful, that's a choice that is better made because the regrets of loss are so large that even though there are some things that I've come to understand that perhaps not many people have, a very high price was paid.
How did it work? In my case, badly. I made as every conceivable mistake possible. I even turned to the shoeshine boys on the street, who managed to score me some pretty rough-edged but smokable sort of hash. <laughs>